So we've talked about task data, resting data, uh, some of the pitfalls. That's, that's kind of the first part of this, this entire workshop. And now we're moving on to actually doing some hands-on things with functional connectivity analysis using the Con toolbox. So for the rest of the day, that's just not a lot of time actually, we're going to be doing a brief overview. We'll be creating our own project file. Loading data, experimenting with some settings. What are the settings that you would most likely change if you were running a, a study? A lot of these defaults, I would never touch them because they just work. Uh, there's been a lot of thought put into this toolbox, and Alfonso and company has done a very, very good job. So like I said, developed by the Whitfield Gabrielli Lab and Alfonso. Um, Alfonso has an NITRC web page. Uh, that's where they mostly have downloaded the Con toolbox. And he's very good at replying to questions. A very good message board there. And his documentation is very good as well. And he's taken a lot of pains to make this a very beautiful looking interface. I have nothing but good things to say about it. It's, it's very, very, very well done. And I haven't had any problems with it. So as we saw when we kind of exercised our muscles with SPM, we have some SPM functions we're going to be using for pre-processing this data as well. Same things with realignment, unwarping, normalization, and smoothing. Now, if you want to, if you've already analyzed a lot of your pre-processing data, uh, if you've already pre-processed a lot of your resting state data, and you've never used Con Toolbox, well, you've actually saved yourself a lot of time already because it will do a basic SPM pre-processing pipeline for you. There are a couple additional bells and whistles which you may not get, such as the, the Art Toolbox uh, detection outlier, but those can be added on individually. You don't need to redo the entire pre-processing for all your subjects. So just be aware, we don't have an example with this, but if you have an spm.mat file, you can simply load that into Con Toolbox and it will know where all the pre-processed data is, which can save you a lot of time. Artifact detection removal, again, you know, Con Toolbox combines all of these into one. If you want to do this outside of it through, say, the Art Toolbox, you're really comfortable with that. You've already done it. Again, you can import this into the Con Toolbox and save yourself time. Okay. So some basic functions are, again, loading data. Pretty simple, both task, resting state, importing things like uh, your, your own atlas, your own ROIs if you want to, which is pretty useful for that. And loading things such as timing files if you want to do a PPI analysis. I didn't get to talk about this too much earlier because I, I skipped over a lot of the, the reproducibility stuff. But one thing I want to come back to is something called the bids format. People heard of this, bids, bids format, relatively new brain imaging data structure. It's a new organizational, it's just a way to organize your data, basically is the way I would say it. If I, if I may, I'm going to go back to this open neuro website. Okay, so everything on here is organized in bids format. So there's a subject number, anatomical directory, func directory, and so on. Now something you might also see if you're going to be doing a, a task-based connectivity analysis are these TSV files. Let's kind of view them. And it has the, the basic things you'll need to do any kind of analysis. The onset in seconds, duration in seconds, and then the trial type. So whatever your condition label is. The great thing about this format is if you output all your timing files into this format, you can load it into the Con Toolbox and it will read it in it automatically. I mean, it assigns everything to the right subject, to the right condition, right timing. I've tried to fool it, actually. And somehow, it, it's, it's, it's witchcraft. It just, it just knows <laughs> somehow like where, where certain things are located because of how they're, they're labeled. So if, not this isn't a requirement, but if you organize your data in the same way, the Con Toolbox and my impression is other software packages as well are going to be a lot easier to use. There'll be fewer problems with loading things. Being back here brings back memories because 
uh, what we originally did back when we had to go through the cold to the Morehouse building and this Phillips scanner. You have a nice Siemens scanner. Congratulations. But this Phillips scanner, we had to you know, grab the data. And then we had to extract everything from Excel spreadsheets to, for timing files. It was crazy. A lot of room for error. So if you do it like this, it makes things a lot easier. And we'll get to that importing function tomorrow. For today, it's simply resting state. Okay, the basic layout is pretty simple. I'm focusing on a few things here. Along the top ribbon, you'll see these different tabs. There's the setup tab, denoising, analyses, and results. And within each of those, you'll have a different menu on the left-hand side. So for example, setup is where you enter all of your basic information about repetition time, sessions, number of subjects, continuous versus sparse, and so on. The viewers, I, I really do like. These are great for quality checks. They'll be covered the first session tomorrow. But after you load everything, you can view all of these different images in different formats, not just in these 2D planes, but within Khan's own viewer. Sorry, it's a little dark. You can't see that. But since it's so tightly coupled with SPM, if you want to, give, given your disposition, you can also open it up in the SPM viewers as well. So they try to make it as smooth a transition as possible if you're a veteran SPM user. There's so many functions which are identical. So if you know SPM, you've already learned actually a lot of the functions of the Khan toolbox. Okay. And lastly, if graphical user interfaces aren't that congenial to your personality, you like to script everything, you like to, to write things from the command line, uh, that's going to be tomorrow as well. So just a heads up. I'll be showing you a template script that you can use to adapt to your data. And the great thing about these scripts, these, these templates which I'm adapting from Alfonso's website, is if your data is in bids format, I could give any one of you that same script and it would work, which is pretty nice. It would go through all the pre-processing, just you know, change the parameters to whatever you know, specific steps you want to do, your specific options, and it will run. I mean, maybe. I mean, there's still some problems with you know, certain things, but you know, for the most part, uh, it should work. All right, so let's now take a look at the Con Toolbox. Again, I'm assuming everybody was able to install it uh, successfully. I looked at it on a couple people's computers, and it seemed to be working just fine. So if I could have you all go back to the MATLAB command line, And what I'm going to have you all do is type the following, type cd tilde desktop. Simply means I just want to do everything from my desktop at this point. Now, if you have the, the BrainBook tab open, I'd like you to... Go back to that. There are a few things I'm going to be talking about here. Um, I'll just go back to BrainBook. Go to actually, you can just scroll down here in this menu and go to functional connectivity and the con toolbox. There's a lot of code snippets on this site that I'll just have you copy and paste into your MATLAB command line, and it should work for the demonstration purposes. So click on that and scroll down to, let's see here, downloading the data. Now I realize you know, some people had a, an issue with downloading the complete data set. That's OK. I've, I've had problems with individual data sets from time to time on Open Neural. But don't worry too much about that. Right click on this link to open it up in a new tab so that we have both of these open. So we have the Open Neural tab, and we have that Brain Book tab. If you click on public dashboard. It lists all these different data sets. These are all in bids format, which is why they've been able to be uploaded. And in the search toolbar, type, oof, if I can spell, 
arithmetic. And it should be the first result that comes up. We're going to be manually downloading the individual images, which for this purpose should be just fine. Um, my plan was we're not going to be analyzing the entire data set just because of time considerations, but by the end of the day, we'll get you going on analyzing a subset of all the subjects. So we're going to be analyzing six of them for a group analysis. So for now, click on that data set and then click on sub 01. Again, this is in vids format. Oops. We have an anatomical file. Download that. Let's click on download. And while it's downloading, also click on func for functional. And download task rest bold dot nii.gz. It's the last image in that folder. Anybody need more time? OK. So I understand this a little bit. It's a little roundabout, but we're just in dealing with the download issue. OK. So what you can do, you can repeat that CD desktop. It's, it's basically going to do the same thing. There's this code snippet, CD desktop, and also make dir con demo. Copy and paste that into your MATLAB terminal in order to create a new folder called con demo. So if you can see your desktop, you should see that a new folder called con demo has been created. That's where all our data is going to be, excuse me, located. Okay, there's some explanatory text. We want to come back to it. What we're going to do now is copy this code snippet, which is actually navigating into the con demo and creating a couple of new directories, sub one func and sub one anat. So we're mimicking the bids data structure because we've just downloaded individual files, and then we're going to place those files within those folders. OK, moving on this next code snippet, you will need to scroll to the right to see everything, but simply hold down your left mouse button, copy and paste this move file command. And again, this is assuming that your files automatically download to the downloads directory. If they have, you can simply copy and paste that into here, and it should move everything into your directories. Any problems so far? OK, I'm not hearing any groans, so it's good. It's good. It's much better than my last workshop, which was in Indiana. So. <laughs> they weren't that bad. All right. So we are now in, we're in the con demo directory. And we have a list of you know, sub 01, sub 02, and so on. Right. Just to make sure everything's where, where it should be, I'm typing ls sub one anat, ls sub one func, and yes, indeed, the data now is stored in the correct directory. Okay, now we have everything in order, and we can actually do the con demo. So we're going to take a brief tour. We're going to do some pre-processing, and while the pre-processing is going, I'll then tell you exactly what pre-processing does and why you're doing it. Okay, so. Type con and press enter. Yeah. Move file doesn't work. Uh, huh. Um, when we start doing pre-processing, I can come over and, and take a look. Yeah. Yeah, Kristen. I'm sorry? Map the directory, the, the con directory. Yeah. Yes. You'll need to set a path that points towards the con directory in order for it to work. Any other questions? Any other issues that came up? 
Okay. So we're, we're going to move forward. Uh, anybody who has any issues with the contour box, I, I'll, I'll come to you in a little second. All right, so here's the basic format and the, you know, what you can do, just a few options if you want to. If you want to increase, say, the, the font size, there the, that's a big A and a small A down here. You know, I like to make it a little bit bigger. Um, it'll become more apparent once we start doing the analyses. Up here, under help, documentation, like I said, the con manual is pretty good. I'm not going to open it right now, but virtually, oh, most, most things will have a, a question or a, some kind of question about it can be answered right there. Also, there is, let's see here. Don't don't click on this yet. Oh, never mind. I thought there was something about. From what I recall, there was a way to automatically download an, an extra data set and start analyzing it. But we're not going to do that in any case. I'm messing it right now. Okay. So click on new. We're going to create a project file. So if you've ever used MATLAB to create a, a structure. This is a, a gigantic structure file that contains fields indicating what options you set and where the data is located. It doesn't really matter what you call this. Just make sure it's being saved in the con demo folder. And I'm going to call it arithmetic underscore pr project. Again, it doesn't, doesn't matter what you call it. Just something that makes sense. The first field is uh, called basic information. For right now, we're going to be analyzing a single subject, so leave number of subjects and number of sessions at one. Later on, you can do more sophisticated things, especially if there are multiple sessions, multiple subjects, and if you're doing something, like, uh, say, a, a, a PPI analysis. For the repetition time, I'll just tell you what it is. You can find this on that website where we downloaded the data from. It was 3.56 seconds. And the acquisition type was continuous for, uh, you know, for virtually all of your designs, it's going to be continuous. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, for sparse, I think there's somebody who who did do a sparse design here. Was that? Yeah, that you. So that may be some an option that you would want to use if you're doing it, say, task-based connectivity analysis. But for the resting state, you'll be wanting to use continuous. So. It's set up in a way where you just simply go down these buttons on the side to fill in each one of them. So the first one's going to be structural. How do we load this data? This is not your data. This is some kind of default image that pops up. We're not going to worry too much about that. To load the data, so subject one is highlighted. And in the right is a search window. We need to find the subject's anatomical image. One way to do it is to actually navigate manually to that subject's folder. Right? So click on sub 01 and then a NAT and double click on that. You're free to do that. Either double click on it or click import. Um, or if you want, make sure I'm doing this the right way. Ah, never mind. Yeah, we'll just do it manually for now. I messed that up. That's easy. Oh, I know why. An asterisk. Right, so there's, there's a filter field down here which you can use. Um, which, if you give it, say, something like uh, these asterisks are called wildcards, so they're going to fill in. As, as it could be one to a hundred million characters, as long as it's a file that ends in .nii, it'll recursively search all the different folders below it and find it. It's overkill for a single subject, but if you have multiple subjects, like a hundred, it'll find all of them instantly, and you can just grab them all in one go and then import them. So for now, I'm simply going to double click on that, and when it says one file assigned to one subject. And then you get something like this. This is a two-dimensional slice in the axial direction. 
And what I like to do is a simple sanity check is just, you know, go up and down in the arrows, check the slices, make sure there are no obvious artifacts, no physiological anomalies that I should be aware of. They're rare, especially in healthy subjects, but you, you do find them. And if you find them, they, they could be a big deal. I've only found a couple in my life, but it's, it's just a check that you have to do. Uh, this plus sign up here will switch the view, so you know, sagittal, coronal, axial, and so on. Uh, however you want to do it, it's really, really up to you. You'll notice the subject is missing the face. All the data that's uploaded to Open Neuro, they've been de-identified. The face has been removed. And if you want to upload your data, you also need to deface it as well. If you click on this image in this window pane right here, it'll open up a new viewer. Sorry, it's a little dark. Let me... That didn't help. You'll see a viewer like this pop up and you can select multiple viewing planes if you want to. It doesn't really help me check the data that much. It's something kind of cool to do if you want to. But you can get used to looking at multiple planes if you want. Set a different reference point and scroll through it like that if you want to. Again, a lot of options. We don't, we're not going to cover all of them, but so many different things about if, if you want to make, say, a figure with one of these, you can do all kinds of different effects, white background, black background, really whatever you want. But for now, this is fine. I mean, we're just looking for major artifacts, right? So nothing really pops up. That's fine. If I then click on functional, we now need to select the functional data. So again, we'll, we'll just do this manually for now. No need to use the, the filter. If you double click on sub 01 funk, and then this image right here, this one that ends in rest bold, double click on it or click import, and it will load it into the con GUI. One file assigned to one subject. You'll now see two images. The first one is, you can see it up here, this is the first volume in that time series, and there are only 200 apparently, 200 volumes in this time series, and it shows the 200th one as well. So why does it show you the first one and the last one in this brief side-by-side -side comparison? Why, why would it show that? Sorry? Make sure they didn't move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Because if, they, if there was a large amount of motion just comparing these side-by-side, -side, it should be pretty clear that it happened. So it's like a first pass just oh, something is wrong. I really need to investigate that a lot more. There are other quality checks, but that's just a default to help people identify it. If you click anywhere in this image, you'll see a sample voxel time series. Again, not, you know, nothing too crazy. But what you'll notice is if you click on certain voxels, you'll see these trends, these trend in the other positive or negative directions. It can be different for different voxels, actually. But these are trends that seem to be caused by uh, the scanner somehow, some, some kind of scanner noise. I'm not, I don't know the physics behind how it all happens, but it, it does tend to happen. So later on, what we'll be doing during denoising is detrending as well. So we're moving both linear trends. You can do more uh, additional polynomials or quadratic trends if there's you know, a, a parabola-like drift cubic if you want to. Beyond that, it, it gets a little unwieldy. But the general idea is if you have a longer time series, it should be, you should have correspondingly more polynomials. Okay. Good guideline is every 100 volumes, maybe add another polynomial order to your drift removal. We'll be going through more of these functional tools on Sunday to do some more advanced QA checks. But for now, you know, same thing. You can go up and down, you can change views. Just getting familiar with the, the layout because the, this type of uh, layout is going to be consistent across all the different tabs in the, the graphical user interface. We're just trying to gain some, some fluency with it. Okay. 
ROIs, conditions, covariates, none of these have been generated yet. This is all going to be a result of pre-processing, which we're going to do in just a second. So just be aware, you know, ROIs, conditions, covariates, those get filled in after pre-processing. And covariates, second level, is something we'll be doing for group level analysis. I'll be reiterating this tomorrow. But once you run your entire analysis, these second level covariates, if you want to, say, do another type of contrast or add another covariate, you need to come back here and enter it and then go back to the results section. That's the only kind of weird uh, flipping back and forth in the, in the interface that I can really think of. Everything else is pretty linear in fashion. You'll need to do one thing before you can do the, the next thing. You'll also notice that these bars at the top, denoising analyses results, they're all grayed out. They haven't been enabled yet because you need to do the pre-processing before you can do denoising, before you can do any kind of analysis. Okay. Um, options. I'll get to the, we'll talk more about those tomorrow. But for now, pre-processing is the main thing that we are going to do. So we're going to pre-process, we're going to check the pre-processing, and we're going to check what's been enabled after that. So if I click on pre-processing, this is the first thing that will show up. It'll say, do you want to do a default pre-processing pipeline for volume-based analysis? Did somebody ask about surface-based analysis? I, I forget. Does that, has that come up with anybody? I think, Mike, didn't you? you, you were, were you going to do surface analysis with? Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I was thinking of something else. But if you want to do the surface analysis on here, you do need to process everything through FreeSurfer. Sorry, that was the connection I was making. FreeSurfer, an entire other package, we'll get to it, I don't, well, not today or tomorrow or in a while, but it is available if you want to analyze everything on the surface. Advantage of that, you get to actually trace the activity or the correlations along the gyri and the sulci. So it gives you better spatial localization. Volumetric, though, is fine for now. And the default preprocessing pipeline is also fine. You'll see an abundance of options. We don't have time to go over all of them. But you'll notice how many individual customizable options you have. The more comfortable you are with resting state analysis, with preprocessing, with everything, you know, you, you may choose to do these in different order or different, I don't know, whatever, certain combinations that you can think of. For the vast majority of cases, and you know, what I do and what I recommend you do, the default preprocessing pipeline will work for everything you need to. So when you select that, it will fill in this field with all, all the different preprocessing steps they're going to do. We're going to run this, and then I'll lecture a little bit more about what they're doing, and then we'll come back to it and look at the preprocessed data. All right, but you can see how many steps are involved in this pre-processing pipeline. Click on Start, and you'll be prompted to select a slice order. Again, I've already looked into all this for you. It's an interleaved Siemens sequence. If you're confused, you don't know, again, this should all be on the scanner manifest when you do your actual scans. So select interleaved Siemens. The outlier detection settings, we're talking about flagging problem volumes that we want to scrub. The defaults are going to say, well, you know, create a distribution and then say, uh, only remove a certain setting or a certain percentile of them. What you can do if you want to do this manually is go to edit settings. And if, for example, all of the individual voxels have been z-scored relative to you know, the, the global signal. And there's an individual volume that's, say, five z-scores above the mean. Even if that subject didn't move, this could indicate that there's some problem with maybe a scanner spike or something like that, right? If it's a, a big problem, you might want to lower this to four or something. I mean, I wouldn't go any lower than that. But that's a pretty good... Uh, Pretty good ideal to have. Okay. And I believe this is across the entire session, if I recall correctly. Anyway, the defaults in this case, intermediate settings, 
work pretty well, so I'm just going to leave them as is. This asks you about the resolution for what you want the output to be. The resolution of the functionals, 2 by 2 by 2, pretty good. You know, if it, you don't necessarily gain special rate resolution if you make it any more than that. It simply divides the signal that's already there into smaller and smaller bits. So 2 or 3 millimeters is fine, I would say. And the last thing is smoothing kernel. Now something funny about, well, let's just click this first. It, it's a default of 8. I'll just leave it at that. That's fine. Uh, so now it should be starting the pre-processing on your machines. And we're going to leave that be for now as I talk a little bit more about other, other topics. OK. We're good. Any problems so far? I mean, if that works, then everything else should work just fine. OK, great. This is good. This is very good. OK, the last. Uh, this is a very short lecture of the day, preprocessing the individual subject. <clears throat> Excuse me. So while that's going on, we've got to ask ourselves, what exactly is this doing, and why, why are we doing it? So as you saw, you have a bunch of different preprocessing options. The default preprocessing pipeline works in virtually all the cases I can think of, you need to really know what you're doing to select something aside from that. But here are the major steps that the default preprocessing pipeline will do. There will be slice timing correction, motion correction, registration, normalization, and smoothing. One of these steps, smoothing, is, is done as part of the default preprocessing pipeline, but the actual connectivity analyses are not done on the smoothed data. You may ask, well, why do they even do it then? Well, we'll talk about these steps. Just have that in the back of your mind because we're going to come back to it. Because this may be something you want to change based on your particular analysis. Uh, so, time and correction is an interesting uh, preprocessing step. There, I don't want to say it's really a controversy, but some people do it, some people don't. I would say that if you have a very short TR, around one second or so, again, this isn't, this isn't a hard and fast rule. Slice timing correction doesn't seem to make too much of uh, a difference, at least in some of the resting state analyses that, that I've looked at. Um, do people do multiband here, by chance? Is, the, is that a default? Is it a default, or do you have to ask for it as a special request? It's default? OK. I will tell you this. So there, you, you have a Siemens scanner here, right? Siemens Trio, something like that? Good scanners. I like them a lot. At Michigan, we have a GE scanner. And I'm not trying to, to slander my own imaging center. We've had a lot of problems with multiband and resting state. Um, multiband, if, if you don't know what it is, you have a, an option to basically uh, increase, decrease the, the, the time it takes to acquire an entire volume by a factor of two or four. You have different acceleration factors. Not to get into details, but basically you, you can just uh, reconstruct an image from one half of case space, if that sounds familiar at all. You're not acquiring the whole thing. You do some interpolations, and it's, I don't know the details. Um, some other people probably know better than I do. But that's the basic idea. So you can get a, a volume very, very quickly on a, s how, how quick is the temporal, the TR with that? One second. Oh, that's great. That's great. So it's acquiring a, like, a bunch of slices simultaneously, right? W with resting state data in particular, uh, that seems to make it even more susceptible, in my experience, to motion artifacts. I don't know what the experience has been here, but that's just my, my two cents. We, we've had a lot of problems with it, and I've actually recommended some labs back at Michigan to not use multiband when doing resting state. Um, doing it with you know, task-based data, in, in my view, doesn't seem to gain you that much. But with resting state, because you sample at more points along the, the, the time series, you can get better detection for what the actual, say, person's time series looks like. You're not sparsely sampling every two or three seconds. So that being said, I would still, you know, do slice time and correction. What it does is 
uh, in reality, in a non multiband sequence, it acquires everything slice by slice, or it can interleave them however you know, your, your scanner is set up to do it, interleaved or sequential. Now, that's the reality of what's happening. Each, each slice is being acquired. And there's a time difference between the first and the last slice of one TR. With slice time and correction, it makes the assumption instead of everything being acquired sequentially, everything is acquired basically at the same time point. You can see why this is an issue because you want, uh, sorry, some people don't like interpolation, which slice time and correction does for the individual slices. And it doesn't, you know, for some people, they, they claim it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference for very short TRs. There's some debate on this topic. But what I was going to say is, uh, what was it? Let me collect my thoughts for a second. What, what was I going to say? I need it. Come on. <laughs> um, so I started correction. Come back to what I, th I think about it. It wasn't, must have not been that much of a, an important point. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, it, reason why you'd want to do slice time correction is that if you know your onset file assumes that a certain event occurred at a, a certain spot a certain time right but the slices are being acquired slightly after that time you want to reinterpret the data as though it always acquired at the same time so your onsets are valid you could if you wanted to have a different onset file for each slice but that would be that would be crazy oh no Away. Motion correction is pretty simple to understand. If the subject moves in either you know, left to right, forward back, up or down directions, all we want to do is invert that to cancel out the effect of that motion. So this means we have to have some kind of reference slice to compare it to. So if they move one millimeter to the right compared to the reference slice, we move it back one millimeter to the left on all the axes all the different planes that they can move. When we do motion correction, you'll see plots like this in the con GUI. Traditionally, there are six of them. There are three dimensions, x, y, z, which you can translate or move along. You can also rotate around those three axes as well. And you'll get plots like this compared to the reference volume. Notice that these all start at zero, right? And they're all deviations from that. So zero, in this case, is the reference volume. Some people say, well, you should use the middle as a reference volume or an average of all of them. It, it, I don't really think it makes a difference. The very first one is just fine for most purposes. What's that? Oh, the first functional image. Yeah. Whoops. Registration and normalization Co-registration means aligning two different modalities, right? So the anatomical, the functional, they have different intensities for white and gray matter. Co-registration matches them up. And then it takes a template, which I've shown on the right, and it tries to adjust that to move it into a standardized space. This is called normalization or warping. Standard voxel sizes and image dimensions. This is important because it allows for a comparison across studies. If I do a study and I report significant results at, you know, x equals 10, y equals 30, z equals 20, and jean Rie does something and he reports results at the same coordinate, we know we're talking about the same one because all the brains have been deformed to match a common shape. Oops. Do I have anything else here? Oh, yeah. The last thing was the common template is called the MNI, Montreal Neurological Institute brain. It's an average of 152 brains that are all in standardized space. That's the most recent template that I know of. Um, the other one, Tallyrack, if you've heard of it, it's more of a, a, a legacy thing. It's, it's pretty outdated at this point. Uh, so I'm not going to say too much about it, aside from it's just not used that much anymore. MNI is the one you'd always want to use. And it's the default with the contour box as well. Uh, 
Uh, so just one more animation to, to drive some of the stuff home. If we have, say, a template image here on the right, and we have uh, a reference image, sorry, our individual subjects anatomical image on the left, here's how some of those uh, pre-processing steps would look for normalization. So it tries to get them in as good an initial alignment as possible. So translations, you know, moving along the different axes. It might rotate them to make the alignment a little bit better. It could do zooms, either make the brain bigger or smaller to best match the outlines. Or it could also do shears, as in I, I take the, the two corners of an image and stretch them apart from each other, a shearing effect. So there, there's three ways to do each of those. That leads to 12 degrees of freedom. Go away. So three translations, three rotations, three zooms, and three shears. These are also referred to as uh, affine transformations. So they match the overall size of position, but not necessarily the shape of all the different convolutions and uh, involutions of the brain. Another, whoops, before I get it away from that. So there's, non, there's also nonlinear transformations if you want to do that. The default in contour box is linear. It's quick. It works pretty well. Nonlinear is going to be better matching these individual folds within the brains. The way it does that, uh, imagine you have a sponge, right? And you can squeeze one end of it really small, and the other one like, can expand a certain amount. But the proportion isn't one to one. With each of those linear transformations, like a like a, a zoom, for example, if I zoom by one percent, it's one percent in all directions. Nonlinear doesn't have those one-to-one -one constraints. I can make it a little bit bigger here, twist it a little bit over here. It just takes a long, long time, and it's not always successful. Linear does pretty well, but if you're interested in very, very, say, fine-scale uh, topological differences, nonlinear is a better option or a surface-based analysis. Again, just takes more time, a lot more data space, but those are options available to you. And lastly, smoothing. Pretty easy to understand. Uh, so I have my original image here and a smooth image over here. It takes a Gaussian kernel, applies a certain amount of uh, averaging of the neighbors to each of these voxels, and then creates this smooth image. So it's going to generate interpolations between you know, a, a, a voxel and its neighbors. The reason we do this in task-based, oh, it finished. The reason we do this in task-based data is it, if there is actually a signal, it'll boost the signal because it's averaging it together. And if there's noise, which should be random deflections, positive and negative, those should cancel out to zero overall, right? The con toolbox, however, it, it will do the smoothing step and does all the other steps. It'll go up through, say, registration, everything like that. But it's not going to extract the time series from the smooth data. It kind of sets it aside. It says, if you want to use this later, go ahead and use it. Why would it, in resting state, why would they not, by default, not want to use the smooth data for that? This is kind of, it's up to you if, you if you want to use it or not. But there's an argument against using it based on the interpolations and everything. Was it? Oh. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, it can create correlations between the neighbors. And because now we're not looking at you know, task-based activation but correlations, it can introduce some things we might not necessarily care about. And it can also introduce correlations between, uh, if we're, say, on the boundary between the gray matter and white matter, it can tend to smooth across those as well. Ooh, good question. The default here is to not smooth. But I, I could see an argument in that case for doing it because, yeah, I mean, you, you do want to detect the signal of, I mean, it, it kind of cuts both ways, right? I mean, which one are you going to wait more, the correlation part of it or the task-based part of it? I, I can't give you a good answer. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
like the registration of normalization stuff. So like, say it's starting with a brain that's larger, right? So it's tracing mm -hmm. it down. What does it do with the activation? Like, does it average the larger activation and like, does it keep it the same when it scales it back down, like the same amount of total activation or does the amount of activation scale down as well? When you're doing a, a task-based? Uh, uh, just like during registration and normalization. Oh, okay. Like how, like what's happening? Like if you're starting with bigger, so in theory there should be more signal just because there's more room. Mm -hmm. What happens when you shrink it down or when you stretch it to the signal? Oh, uh, with the time series that you're seeing in each one? It does get interpolated to some degree, okay. right? So if, if you're, if you say, say the original voxel size was 3 by 3 by 3, you're resampling it to 2 by 2 by 2. Yeah, you are basically dividing that into smaller cubes, and they each... So how, how does it determine, if, you, if you're in this bigger cube, how to apportion how much signal to give to each of those smaller ones? Um, there are different methods for doing that, like the kind of the roughest one is basically just like split it evenly between all of them and scale it down like that. Like if it breaks it into four equal parts, scale it you know, by four. Um, there, there, I, and I know there are more advanced ways to do it, but I can't say too much about them right now. Yeah. There's this whole idea with resampling and how to, um, you may have heard of like uh, nearest neighbor, if you resample to a different grid, what value should it take? Right? Should it take the one of uh, its nearest neighbor or do you interpolate it between uh, different voxels that that it's now located with uh, between. Yeah, so I, I can't really explain that with my words too well, but there are. I do have. I'm not going to go back to my book, but I do have an emanation on the book showing how this nearest neighbor interpolation works, how it how it assigns a new value to a voxel once it's been resampled. Okay. So, uh, okay. Well, actually, we're going to check that today. Uh, so pre-processing has finished. I'm assuming. Anybody is it still running? Oh, yeah. Anybody having issues? So Alana, Robert, Jan. Okay. What's it saying? Is that only four, four people? Okay. I'll tell you what. So raise your hand high if you've been having an issue with the pre-processing part of it. Okay, I'm going to pass the, because who knows what it could be. It could be just some, some MATLAB thing. I can't really troubleshoot. So I'll pass this around. Just simply copy the con demo folder to your desktop. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Multiple structural files. Let me finish up with this, and then I'll take a look at it when we're, yeah, when we're finished. Okay. So you should see something like this at the very end of it all, right? So these are the fully pre-processed images. It's showing you the smooth data, even though that's not necessarily what we're going to use for the correlation analysis. But this indicates that it has actually finished. If you go back and look at the structural one as well, you will see that it looks a little bit different. Like the skull has been removed, it's been skull stripped, it's been intensity normalized. So if it's the, the white matter signal, if it was pretty bright, it's made it even brighter. Gray matter signal has been made even grayer so that when we segment the two, we have a very clean demarcation between them. Right? It boosts the contrast between the two. Whoops, sorry, I meant to select ROIs. Uh, but yeah, just checking those two to make sure it looks skull stripped, it looks in the correct orientation, and it looks like everything worked without any problems. So these ROIs, regions of interest, this is what the con toolbox is going to use for its connectivity analysis and also for denoising purposes. So a few different masks have been created during the segmentation step. There's gray matter, white matter, and CSF. Right? When you go between those three things, I'm using my up and down arrows, they should pretty cleanly parcelate the brain into the three tissue types. So if I added these all together, it should be one kind of uniformly uh, bright image, right? So that's all I'm looking for. I mean, does the gray matter seem to be in the gray matter, white matter to the white matter, CSF and the CSF? What is this thing? 
it says that's gray matter. Can that be possible? It's inside the brain. Did it screw up? Should we riot against Alfonso? It's treachery. What is this? Anybody have an idea? Neuroanatomist? Ah, yes. Very good. Caudate. You know, it's hugging those ventricles. And as we say, go further up or further down, you might see other subcortical nuclei, right? Say, such as the thalamus, for example. So just be aware of that. I mean, you really need to use your eyes to make sure that, okay, yeah, it's, it's these, these gray matter nuclei that are within, or under the cortex. If you click on Atlas, now, after you've done pre-processing, the contour box will automatically load some uh, default, a couple default atlases. This first one, you'll, you'll see how this brain is parcelated. This is based on the Harvard-Oxford cortical atlas. Okay, it's an atlas that comes by default with FSL. You may have seen it there. Uh, it's created by Harvard and Oxford, as you can tell by the name. So these different parcellations, what we're going to be doing is averaging across all the voxels within these ROIs and correlated them with every other ROI in the brain to create those that connect home I was referring to previously. If you click on that atlas, I mean, this isn't really a quality check. I mean, it's, it's just done by, well, I guess it is kind of a quality check. You'll see how this parcellation is mapped onto uh, your individual subject, right? So you can see it's color-coded. If you, if you click on one of these, you'll see uh, in this right-hand side over here, okay, the label number is 55. That's the index. And it's the anterior cingulate gyrus anterior division. I click somewhere else, the cingulate gyrus posterior division. Click anywhere, middle frontal gyrus, frontal pole. These should be matching up pretty well with your data, right? Your data has been normalized, pre-processed, everything, and the segmentation has now mapped these parcellations onto your data set. So we're just making sure that it actually looks reasonable. So last thing here, networks. You're given 32 networks. And again, you click on this, you can see how these things are related to each other. They're color-coded so that different networks uh, should be pretty, pretty obvious how they correspond to one another. I'm looking for one in particular. Default mode network, can I find it? So default mode PCC. Default mode. MPFC. Okay, so this is not actually 32 networks, but it's 32 ROIs, and certain ones of them will, will be clustered into different networks, like the DMN. Uh, there's a salience network. There's a couple other ones that the Contool box has. If you want to import your own atlas, could be something you created. Um, actually, we'll be, we'll be using one that I created tomorrow. It's, it's got four voxels in there. It's crazy. It's, just the, it's a great atlas. You can have, uh, you can import it. You can import whatever you want. It could be, you know, you think that the, the power Alice was really good. You like that one? You want to use that? You simply download that. Uh, I think I tried importing his and it, it worked the first time. As long as you have just an individual number for the voxels you want to code as belonging to one parcellation or another. So any, any kind of one that you want. This is a good default, so I'm going to leave it as is, but I'll show you some more options tomorrow. Yes, it does. Um, I have not actually done that yet. But yeah, the question was, does Khan support individual subject ROIs? And yes, you can definitely do that. Yeah. You actually see down here um, subject specific ROIs as opposed to an Alice file. You see that at the bottom there? So if you create a subject specific uh, template, you can, you can load it here for the subjects. Um, I'm not going to go through all that. Again, there's so many options. I'm just going to cover some of the, the most important ones. Yeah? Excuse me. At what stage would you load uh, the GMEX? 
Good question. Good question. I'm still worried. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that right off the top of my head, but there should be a way to do that. Um, it's funny because one of the, the options I'm going to be giving you tomorrow, at the very end of this workshop, the idea is we will start to analyze a, a new data set, something that we select from online. And then you know, once we kind of agree on some of the basic approaches, I'll write up like a, a basic walkthrough for that new data set that, that we can all follow. And one of them is with patients who have had a, a hemispherectomy. So that might be an interesting topic to, to do. Uh, so let me think about it. I mean, you're not the only one who's been asking about it. Um, there's some other clinical areas, obviously, that want to use it. I do know, I mean, it is, I've done it with something like, uh, say, FSL, where you indicate which particular voxels you want to exclude. But for this, I'll have to get back to you. The short answer is I don't know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm almost positive that, that you can. Okay. Uh, conditions we'll get to tomorrow because uh, that, that really is only for the task data sets. By default, it, it just includes one regressor that models the entire run. Right? So, I mean, we're not, we're not doing any contrast between conditions here. This it is just indicating that this is uh, a single run and that we're correlating them. We're, Analyzing, we're computing that every voxel, then comparing those correlations across the entire brain. Covariance first level is the last thing we're going to look at here. Again, these, these motion parameters I was talking about before. You can see as it indexes as we scroll along, it'll show you, it'll give you six numbers in a vector, and each one is indicating how much in millimeters is deviating from the XYZ and also the uh, roll pitch yaw trans. Or, rotations as well. From this alone, it can be difficult to determine whether there is a, a real problem. If you see a sudden spike, for example, you might, you might uh, take note of that. But I'll s if you go to scrubbing, you'll notice that no volumes pass that threshold that we specified earlier. To, uh, later on, when we analyze all the subjects, you will see that you know, some subjects do have certain volumes scrubbed, and they'll appear in this window right here. But that's where we'll show up. Yeah, Alana. Oh, yeah. Anybody else need to load the data? Hun? Uh, didn't you? Uh, OK. OK, so for those who just downloaded the data, uh, I don't think you'll need to do this, actually. OK, the, so what I'm going to end with is, let's see here. So click on done. So we've done all the pre-processing, everything. Uncheck voxel to voxel. This is simply in the interest of time. And you know, voxel to voxel is a little bit more uh, sophisticated in depth. We're gonna be focusing mostly on ROI to ROI and seed to voxel. So go ahead, click start. And what this is going to do is it's going to import all the data from all those ROIs that were loaded by default. Okay, the Alice, the networks, if you want your own ROIs. It's going to import that, and then we'll have a new tab that's going to be enabled, the denoising tab. We're going to see what effect these different denoising parameters will have on the actual data we're analyzing. Take only a couple minutes. While we're waiting, any any outstanding questions? Anything that hasn't made sense yet? Yeah. Oh, field map correction. That should be an option in one of the pre-processing steps. I don't think it's I, is it selected by default? I, didn't, I haven't actually checked. But yeah, if you've collected a field map, you should be able to use that for unwarping. If it's not included in there, 
and I'd be surprised if it's not, you could simply do it outside of it and just simply load the pre-processed data into the contour box. Yeah. Uh, what Mike was asking about is something called unwarping, if you haven't heard about it. Uh, there are these fluctuations in the, the magnetic field, right? Just as a function of the person being in the scanner. We try to make it as homogenous as possible, but that's not always the case. And these, these fluctuations tend to be more severe when there's a rapid transition between, say, air and tissue. So let's say from the, or between air and bone. So from the sinuses uh, to nearby tissue. And unwarping uh, a field map will outline which parts, which voxels have certain deflections and simply apply the inverse to it. So if your brain looks kind of squished or warped, it will unwarp it. Anybody still waiting for denoising, the denoising tab? Yeah, okay. You're still waiting? Does it say five of seven, six of seven? Five of seven is just two of seven. Okay. It says four? Okay. That's uh, all right, that's all right. Uh, It's on step three or has? No, I found step five has three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Well, I'm, while we're waiting, I'm, still, I'm just going to start talking a little bit about this. I mean, it, 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 it'll catch up eventually. Uh, okay. So, denoising. This over here, so we have only one subject at this point. You've probably seen this before. I, I, I show this during the, the whole debate on GSR. There's the original correlations, and it gets shifted to the left a little bit as a result of all the denoising that we're applying. So this includes not only motion correction, motion scrubbing, but also these principal components that we're including. So this is the so-called ANAT comp core, right? We extract principal components from white matter and from CSF, and we include those as nuisance covariates. What you'll see on the right here is the percent of bold variance explained by those components. So the CSF components, not surprisingly, tend to load not all of it, but mostly within the CSF, which in the case, you know, probably did a pretty good job. Uh, same thing with white matter. You'll also get some oops, CSF components, but also some white matter components as well. There are, by default, five principal components that extracts from each tissue type. If you want to extract more, for whatever reason, in this confound dimensions, you can increase it if you want to. Now, as you include more and more principal components, you're explaining less and less variance. So beyond five, you're probably, probably not getting much out of that. If I extract just one, what does that look like? It doesn't seem to explain much. But five, uh, let's, let's just keep it at five. For realignment, you'll notice, okay, I talked about six motion parameters, right? Translations and three dimensions and rotations as well. But you'll notice we see we have 12 parameters right here, right? You'll notice it says add first order derivatives. This is becoming more and more common, not just in resting state, but also in task data, task related analyses as well. So if, if I have my motion parameters, and then I compute the derivatives. Can somebody give me a reason why I would want to include derivatives versus, or, or maybe not? What would be a good argument for including derivatives? If you think about the way that people typically move their heads, <laughs> there's no typical way. But uh, let, me just, let me just say it. OK, so if you're moving your head, it's highly unlikely that I'll just go like that or that or that, right? That doesn't usually happen in, in real life. So if we have derivatives, those capture more subtle, sophisticated motions, right? So if I'm kind of going this way, both forward and rotating a little bit, those derivatives should capture that kind of motion a little bit better, is a theory. You can include second order derivatives if you want to you say you think that they're like really, really subtle motions that you want to capture. First order derivatives is, is pretty good. This highlights a, a fundamental balance you got to keep in mind. Uh, the more parameters I use, the more degrees of freedom that I'm using as well. Degrees of freedom, to, to use uh, an imperfect analogy, they're like, it's like currency, right? 
And the degrees of freedom in a resting state scan is determined by the number of individual volumes that you have. So if we have 100 volumes, we have 99 degrees of freedom to spend, right? Because it's n minus 1 it's degrees of freedom. That's just the mathematical formula. And each of these is going to eat up, uh, this will eat up 12, 5, 5, 2. So you lose a little bit of power with each additional regressor that you estimate. The balance is always between how do I estimate the most variance and retain the most degrees of freedom. Because you have more degrees of freedom, you have more power, but you also want a model that is a very accurate reflection of the data. So it's up to you what uh, amount of these different you know, parameters you want to include. It's you know, really up to you. If you want to include things like, um, you know, these first order derivatives are always an option. Uh, if you want to capture something about, I don't know, if, if, if for example, you're doing a task-based analysis, these first order derivatives would capture something like uh, a temporal derivative, let's say. So if there's, a, if there's a delay in, if there's variation in the delay for when the HRF tends to rise, that's another way you can use a derivative. Are you done with, the, anybody else need the external hard drive? Okay, okay, I think. If this next step works, we should all be up to date. The last thing I'm going to ask you all to do. Oh, thank you. So we're, we're basically, uh, should we do this? Mm. Yeah, let's do it, let's do it. Click on done, uncheck voxel to voxel, and click start which will apply the, the denoising. We're, we're going to go a few minutes over. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I had a long lunch, fortunately. This step should not, shouldn't take too long, but a couple computers are, are we, Alcata? Three, uh, three or six? Okay, we're going to. Zoom ahead. So now we have another tab available. Okay, this is all we can do before group level analysis. If you click on these connectivity measures, C to voxel and ROI to ROI, okay, these are yoked together, it gives you both of these. You'll notice that it automatically selects all these different seeds and sources. And you can also see, okay, if I have my frontal pole right selected for seed region. Not surprisingly, the most correlation is going to be within this right frontal region, right? Okay, that's not surprising. We don't care too much. We do care about how it uh, correlates with other parts of the brain, though. I don't know. Example, back here or back here. You know, if you click on it, you can see what, you know, the seed time series looks like compared to what you just clicked on. I mean, it doesn't really do that much, but you can see kind of how they, they co-vary with one another. Same thing from for frontal pole left. If I go down a little bit, it's the highest down there. Insular cortex. You know, a lot of these are bi bilaterally correlated. But just, you know, some basic checks, making sure that this actually did run. So these are the, the functional connectivity maps that we've been talking about so far. We've, we have, in fact, generated them. And if you want to, again, uh, don't feel the need to to, to go along with this because I'm going to move a little quickly here. But you'll note, oh, come on, you'll notice, okay, got it? You'll notice that uh, in, in the directory where you started all these analyses, there is a folder called arithmetic project. Within that, there's a folder called results. There is a directory first level, and then SBC or seed-based correlation for subject 01. When we start doing the second level analyses, this will be filled in with all of the individual correlation maps for every seed region. I'll talk about those more tomorrow. But if, so, so I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but a lot of people, what they like to do, they love the way that the contour box does denoising and principle and, and comp core and motion correction, all that, they like it a lot. 
the graph theory stuff it works, but if you want something more sophisticated, you can then take those individual correlation maps and import them into another toolbox like the brain connectivity toolbox, if you're so inclined. We will not cover that today or tomorrow, but be aware that a lot of people do do that for more advanced graph theory stuff. We'll be, we'll be covering Khan's version of that, which it's not exhaustive, it's not that extensive, but it, it's, it still looks pretty good and for most purposes is probably what you need. Okay, so we're going to finish with one more thing. We're going to start an analysis for six subjects. Okay, so again, because the download button was on the fritz, uh, this is going to be a little, a little tedious, but bear with me. If you can find, uh, go back to this open neuro data set. The link is on the schedule if you have trouble finding it. So open neuro arithmetic. We're going to set this up and then we'll start the pre-processing here uh, if, if, if you're inclined to. And your mission is going to be just making sure it finishes overnight. It shouldn't take more than in total maybe an hour, I would say. I mean, you know, people are still having trouble with it. can either use this tomorrow morning. The first lecture is going to be uh, on quality assurance checks, so you have time there or you can try to rerun it then. But I just want people to, to get started with it right now. So from here, we're going to be doing the same thing with uh, you know, sub 2 We're going to be downloading individual files. So for each subject, just download the anat, and in the func directory, download this task rest bold. It's the very last functional image. So take a few moments and do that for every subject. And then I'll give you some code to organize everything. Yeah, the first six. So sub, we've already downloaded sub 01. We're going to do sub 02 through sub 06. Okay, anybody need more time downloading the images? Okay. Okay. Are we good? Finished? Oh, still going? Oh, okay, okay. Once everything has been downloaded, if you go back to the, the book, it's still open. Um, let me see here. You can see this table of contents on the left over here under you know hit functional connectivity. We're going to go to group level analysis. So we've already analyzed a single run for a single subject. And we have another code snippet here. This is a for loop. It's going to, just like we did before, organize all the files so that they're in the same directory format. So copy and paste that. Um, before, well, let me see. Should it work from anywhere? No. 
Bef okay, don't, don't press enter yet. Sorry, I should have been clear about that. Uh, go to CD, tilde, desktop, and then your con demo folder, right? The one that contains the sub 01 directory. You may already be there. I, I did a little bit of wandering, so I just want to make sure that we're all in the same directory before we run the code. Yeah. So if you copy and paste that, Should work without any errors. Did it work? Woo, okay. I'm always <laughs> never know what's gonna happen. Um, let's see here. All right, let's go back. Go back to our con GUI. Click on setup and then go back to basic. Instead of one subject, now we have six. And it automatically fills in all the other fields. It assumes that everybody has the same number of sessions and the same TR. You're welcome to change it if they're actually different, but in most cases, it's a pretty safe bet. OK. If we go to the Structural tab, this is where this, this find command becomes very, very useful. Um, I know we already analyzed subject one, but I'm simply going to just overwrite everything because it's easier to do that in one batch than kind of do them separately, then try to combine them. So in this right-hand side, click on these two dots. This indicates just go up one directory until you reach this folder that contains all of your subjects. Right? This is the con demo folder. Hold shift and highlight and click to highlight all these six subjects right here. And then over here, just give me a second. I want to make sure I'm doing this right because I kind of forgot. T1W. Okay. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Okay. You'll notice. Okay. So I'm basically looking for anything that ends in T1W. Now we have a lot of files here because there's been a lot of files pre-processed from sub-01. Ideally, I would have done this you know, from the very beginning before pre-processing anybody. But what I want you to do is click Shift and highlight these last five. Okay, so sub-01, two, three, four, five, six. Those are the raw anatomical images, as well as this one right here. So hold Command or Control, and then also select sub-01 anat sub 01 T1W. This is also the raw anatomical image for sub 01. Any questions on that before I hit import? I, I missed part of oh. T1W. Yeah, in this, in this field down here. So it's going to recursively search all the directories and grab those files that have this T1W. And I highlight the subject 1 through 6 on the right hand side? Yeah. On the bottom, select two through six, and also sub one and that sub one T one W, the one that hasn't had any pre-processing done to it yet. I can I can take a look. Anybody else trouble with that? Oh oh. Uh, click click on find. Yeah. So scroll down. Hold shift and select those. Uh, yeah. And then uh, control and select that one right there. Oh, sorry. Deselect that one. Uh, this one right above it. So that one and then those. Yeah, you're good. And click import. Yeah. All right. All right, everyone. I'm just going to go through this one more time. So again, if you know, I didn't have anything here. OK, so I'm in the con demo. I have all of these subjects selected, all of them highlighted. I go over here, I type T1W, and I click Find. Yeah. Scroll down. I select all of these, and I hold Control, and also select this raw sub-01 T1 weighted image. You might think that, oh, oh yeah, Uni?
Yeah. yeah. And then if you yeah. go over here. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, click on that. So star dot. This is a. Yeah. But then the one below that is going to look for anyone. Ah. Yeah. Oh, you got it? Oh. Oh, wait. Did you copy and paste the... Uh, oh, here. Oh, maybe I didn't put those files into the folder. Okay. Maybe that's why. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Okay. Any other problems? Are we good? Okay. So click import. And then it's going to assign six files to six subjects. And if you walk through them individually, they should look different. They don't look different? Okay. Just sit tight. I'll get back to you in, in one second. Now for functional. Same idea, we're going to highlight all these subjects. And we are going to look for, let me find it here. That constrain the string bold. OK. And then in this find field down here, Click bold, find, and again, the ones at the very bottom, we're going to select all those, two through six, as well as it's kind of a pain to find. There's one that doesn't have any prefixes appended to it. It says sub one func, sub one task, rest, bold. You may think this is a huge pain in the butt. And it is, which is why when we get to scripting, this removes all of this guesswork, all these potential mistakes that we could make. But it's worth trying to do this at least once to actually see how to do it through the conduit. I don't like doing this either, but it's necessary. OK, when you have it, click Import. And I'll be walking around if people are still having trouble with that. Okay. Then that's a, yeah. Oh, I just just redo it. Oh yeah. Wait, did, did you? It looks right to me. No, shouldn't it be the one below it? Oh, um, it it this one already it uncompresses it, so it, it doesn't basically matter. it doesn't matter. Yeah. OK, everybody, if everybody's ready, I know there are a few people who still have some issues. I'll come around to you in a second. Simply click Done. Uh, I would remove voxel to voxel because, again, it, it takes a long time and we don't have the, the time for it. Then click Start, and we'll go through the same things that we did for the single subject. Oh, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. Quick stop. Sorry. I, I screwed up. It should all still be selected. Oh, I thought I pressed done for some reason. Pre-processing start, right? OK. Click on pre-processing and then click on start. Should work. OK, yes. You'll be given the same options as before, interleaved Siemens. Uh, functional outlier detection is fine. The resampling is fine. And the smoothing kernel is also fine. So click OK for all that. It will start running again. This takes about an hour. Um, 
So if you need to, I mean, if you need to take this computer home, bring it back to your lab, so we've plugged in, and it should be ready. I mean, we'll still need to do denoising, and you know that will take another, say, 10, 15 minutes, but that can easily be done tomorrow morning during the lecture. You can do it if you want to on your own time. That's fine. OK, who was still having problems uh, importing all that? Two over there and Alana. Anybody else? OK, so thank you all so much. I also have a couple of other people to meet with after, afterwards, uh, Kelly and Zhongui. So thank you so much. I will see you tomorrow at 9 AM here. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't want to do it, but that's the way it just worked out. I know. I had to, I had to be back in Ann Arbor. By seven. <laughs> what else? I kind of I want to invite people to go eat later. Should I do that? Okay. One more announcement, everybody. Who who's interested in uh, getting dinner as a group? No pressure. We got one. <laughs> oh, this is sad. I'm going to go to, what's a good restaurant? Cazuela's? No? What's a good restaurant? It's changed so much. Go to Melt, get grilled cheese. Where? Melt? That's where You can get grilled cheese. Okay. Is that a good dinner place? That sounds like a lunch place. Um, what? Okay. Oh, man. I thought everybody would just be like, yeah.